Let me pray as we start. Dear Father, thank you so much that you have inspired uh, the Apostle Peter by your Holy Spirit to uh, give us uh, many good gifts through uh, the truths that we find in this wonderful letter. Father, thank you that you've reminded us again and again that we are uh, living in a world that's not our final home. Uh, and you've given us lots of encouragement to long for the day when you're going to remake this whole uh, universe and we're going to get to enjoy it sinlessly with you. We look forward to that. Uh, please help us as we engage with this letter one more time. In Jesus' name. Amen. So um, the only interaction that I can demand from you tonight is a show of hands, which only I can see um, and other people can't see. So if I'm doing this and this, that's because I'm looking at your faces and then I'm looking at the camera. Um, but just so you know, let me ask you a quick question. Delayed gratification. How many of you know what that means? Okay, okay. Um, delayed gratification, having to wait for something that you really want because there's something better coming around the corner. Okay, let's think about that for a second. Delayed gratification, I hate it. Any show of hands, does anybody love it? Any thumbs up, anybody loves it? <laughs> Nobody loves it. Well, two people, two people, amazingly, two or three people. Um, okay, now I hate it because I... I don't like waiting for stuff and I don't like working, living my life on the basis that something good is coming and I have to wait for it. Okay. So if you know the feeling of eating rubbish before dinner and not being hungry for dinner, you're in my camp. You don't like delayed gratification. If you buy stuff on impulse without consulting your bank balance or your wife, you don't like delayed gratification. If you look forward to Christmas, but you don't look forward to when someone gives you a gift, having to wait until Christmas Day to open it, you're in my camp. You don't like delayed gratification. Now, waiting for something that's to come and putting up with all sorts of other things so, until you get it is actually at the heart of the view of suffering in the New Testament. And we're going to see a little bit of that uh, in 1 Peter again, because in the New Testament, suffering is really kind of the pathway to glory, that glory in being spending eternity with Christ. And so we are going to journey through uh, 1 Peter 3, 17 to 22. And I'm going to read that now uh, just with you. Uh, sorry, I didn't actually put the text on the screen, but um, it's a motivation for you to open your Bibles. Um, and then we're going to have a look at 1 Peter 3. I'm going to read from 17, actually. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities and powers in submission to him. So, really fantastic and crazy passage. You might be disappointed that we don't get as much time as we like to uh, you know, dwell on the controversial verses or anything. But when you look at verse 17, the cool thing is the verses to come are almost an explanation of it. So Peter says, it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. And I'm going to uh, try and challenge you with the thought that um, actually to suffer like Jesus is a good thing. Uh, whatever association we have uh, in our difficulty with Jesus. And Jesus is surf suffering uh, as much as ours uh, as believers was with purpose, was with an end in sight, and with a resurrection hope. And then we're going to have a look at how Peter quotes uh, the life of Noah in Genesis. And we're going to say uh, they want to suffer like Noah because he was outnumbered, but he was faithful. Now let's talk about this. Suffer like Jesus with purpose. Now, what, what do these things have in common, I wonder? Here's a sand castle that actually took two years to be built. Um, it's meant to be the tallest sand castle um, that we know of. 
uh, sadly, the first attempt uh, was they were almost finished. Uh, it was uh, built uh, right up there, as you can see. I mean, you can see the tiny people uh, next to it. But by the time the Guinness World Book of uh, the Guinness uh, people, judges, came there, um, the elements had completely destroyed it, which must be really frustrating. Um, here's another uh, potentially frustrating thing. Would you see a point in learning further maths if you wanted to be a hairdresser? I don't know. Would you? I mean, I don't, I don't, still don't see the point of it unless uh, maybe you're an engineer. This is, these things are all beyond me. Um, but these are examples of things that to some of us might feel like investing a lot of time, money and energy in. It might feel like it's a bit worthless, a bit pointless. Not maths in general, by the way. I don't want to upset any uh, mathematicians in the room here um, who are doing this at this point. Um, but the, the point is that and if I wanted to be a hairdresser, that might not be something that I need to invest time in. And I think I really struggle to invest time in something if I don't feel like there's a real purpose to it. And I think when we come to read uh, what Peter has to say about suffering, um, it makes all the difference in the world for us as followers of Jesus. If we feel like there is purpose and meaning right in the middle of um, a difficulty like lockdown, like loneliness or any other trial that you might be facing. Now, you might feel like that about guidelines uh, at the moment uh, or about another sort of tough time that you're going through. But Peter reminds us that suffering with purpose changes how we see ourselves in God's great plan. That's why he begins by expanding on verse 17. Because when we look at Jesus' suffering, we see that uh, there is a beautiful good that is brought out of his suffering so that it's not just pointless. And then I guess we want to think, if the Father brought good out of Jesus' suffering, what would that mean for us today as Christians? That means this same God can have a reason and a point. That's why in verse 18, he uses that little word also, isn't it? He's trying to say, hey, Jesus also suffered, like you're suffering, uh, the churches that people that Peter is writing to. And what was the good that came out of it? Well, he says there, to bring you to God. Now, that's completely different to the expectation that people who are often uh, not, not Christians out there uh, looking in don't really get, do they? They think that being a Christian is either about being good, and that's been completely destroyed in our Galatians series, right? You've seen that in the book of Galatians. That's just not true. It's not about being good. But then sometimes we can live and behave as if all God wants from us is to cancel our debt of sin, to forgive us, and move on. But the description here is Jesus suffered, died, was raised again uh, to life to bring you to God, to bring you to God. The purpose is relationship. Um, and, and I think that's why there's a paradox, isn't it? Those of you who are mature, seasoned, you know, valiant Christians, believers, you've been Christians for a long time, you've lived a little. Let me ask you a question. OK, when have you been closest to God? Was it a when all is going swimmingly in your life or is it b when things are tough and you're driven to prayer and Bible reading? I think what most of you would say is B, really. Now, young people who are uh, watching in the Zoom call this evening, hear this message. Because it's really hard when tough things happen and we're not expecting them uh, to actually run to God uh, for help and for him to say, uh, for us to say to him, grow me, mature me, use this. But you can talk to almost any believer in this Zoom call who has been around the block for a few years um, and ask them, what was it like for you? Now, one of the things, though, that's really interesting is throughout the, the letter of 1 Peter, even though there's a lot of talk about suffering, here's one thing that I don't see. OK, I don't see Peter connecting every little bit of suffering with exactly what God taught each Christian. And in fact, I think as I read the Bible, I would want to even discourage people from trying to find the exact learning point that you had. Because sometimes in God's big mind, he's able to see things that we're not able to see. Instead, what Peter wants to do is say, look, 
Look at somebody like Noah. He suffered. It was it was hard. Look at somebody like Jesus. His suffering was hard. Um, you can look at other narratives that Peter could have quoted from. Maybe Job. Job didn't even know um, the whole background that we know from chapters one and two um, about uh, Satan and what's going on in the background. And yet what Peter wants us to think about is this. Christian, even though you might never know the intricate details, your suffering has purpose. If you're following in the footsteps of Jesus. But not only that, um, you know, there is also an end date for the suffering. So that's why it's important for us to look at how Jesus faced trials, because he was always telling the disciples and knowing that, yes, he was going to die, but he was going to rise again from the dead. And I think we see little glimpses of um, kind of Jesus's hope in resurrection. Uh, Think about, for example, the time when we had, did I put this on here? I don't think I did. Um, but Isaiah 35, when Jesus was healing the blind, um, healing the deaf, uh, and immediately, if you knew the book of Isaiah, you might have gone to this passage. Let me read it to you. Isaiah 35. Then the blind people will see again, then the deaf will hear, crippled people will jump like deer, and those who can't talk now will shout with joy. Springs of water will flow in the desert, streams will flow in the dry land. And that same passage talks about a time when God is going to create this reality in Isaiah 35, verse 10. The people the Lord has freed will return there. They will enter Jerusalem with joy. This is people probably in captivity. Their gladness and joy will fill them completely. Sorrow and sadness will go far away. I think kind of the point is this. Some uh, Christian somewhere is suffering right now. You imagine at the time of Jesus. Jesus comes around, does miracles that connect exactly with this passage. And people think, yeah, there are glimpses here of how whatever I'm encountering right now, whatever I'm finding difficult, there is an end date to it. And I see that Jesus has just shown me a little sign of what that's going to look like. A world without disease, without illnesses, without COVID. And I see a little bit of that in the pages of the New Testament. It makes me long for it. So suffering has an end date in sight. But not only that. Suffering has this resurrection hope that we want to say a little bit more about as we move swiftly on. One of the glimpses of Jesus's, I think, resurrection, life resurrection hope is um, through how through each trial he matures us. He grows us. Now, I am kind of scared of saying this because there was a teacher in my Bible college um, in New York who uh, was called Steve. And he taught me the book of Hebrews. And it was really interesting because every time he was reading through something in the Bible, um, he would say to me, it's a curious thing, isn't it? Whenever you start reading through something in the Bible, like a virtue, like patience or something, you know, self-control, God puts me in the right, right smack dab in the middle of a situation where I have to grow in that virtue, in that thing that I'm reading in the Bible. Does that ever happen to you? Does that ever happen to anybody? That's a curious thing, isn't it? You're reading something in the Bible and God puts you right in the opportunity where you can learn what that means. And I think this changes how I face tough times. Because my confidence is the same resurrection life that Jesus was showing on the pages of the New Testament is my confidence that when I suffer, when the time comes, God is going to um, show me again, This there is an end date for this, but the little bit that I mature, the little bit that I grow is making me more like the Jesus that I want to be with and see throughout eternity. It just increases my longing to be with him. And I mean, today is, um, I know it's really Wednesday, but today we are uh, celebrating those who gave uh, their lives and continually, uh, you know, offer their lives as sacrifice so that we can experience peace in this country. Uh, and that just reminded me of a book uh, that I read a few months ago. Uh, this book, actually, which I think I've also got on there. Um, 12 Days on the Somme, uh, a memoir in the trenches by this guy called Sidney Rogerson, who was a British Army uh, soldier. Uh, he uh, just fantastic experiences to be able to uh, read him. But here's a quote by him that I think shows little glimpses of how out of suffering, like the Lord Jesus, God brings something good. Um, here it is. He says this. Uh, this is in 1933. 
uh, so a long time after his experiences uh, in uh, the First World War. We were privileged, in short, oh, let me sh show you the quote there. We were privileged, in short, to see a reign of goodwill among men, which the piping times of peace, with all their organized charity, their free meals, free hospitals, and Sunday sermons, have never equaled. Despite all the propaganda for Christian fellowship and international peace, there is more animosity, uncharitableness, and lack of fellowship in one business office now than in a brigade of infantry in France then. Otherwise, we could never have stood the strain. Now, I have no authority, really, to tell you about suffering and what you should do when you're suffering. That's why I have to be pointing to the scriptures. Somebody like this, who was in, who saw horrendous things um, in the First World War, if they can say, in a situation like that, we're able to see more camaraderie and virtue and goodness than in a time of peace, how much more can the God of the universe bring good out of a difficult situation? I'm quite amazed by that, really. That's why Peter highlights the fact that Jesus suffered and died, but was raised to a victorious life. It says here, he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit, code name for raised from the dead, like the Old Testament saints hoped um, uh, in the Jewish scriptures. And then he went and made proclamation to imprisoned spirits. Now, this is a verse that makes me a little bit um, uncomfortable uh, because, you know, if we go wrong here, we're going to end up saying that we can pray for the dead somehow. Or there's a second chance that Jesus preaches to those who are dead uh, somewhere. And so I think if we misinterpret this, we could be in a really tough place. I don't think that we can say that there's a second chance for people because of passages like Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that says very clearly uh, that you can look that up. I haven't put that on the presentation, uh, but that it's appointed for mankind to die, to live once, to die, and then to be judged. There's no there's, there's no wiggle room there. But I want to interpret this passage, and I think, uh, well, I, I want you to do the same, that whenever you find a difficult passage, look at the context. What is the author of the book really trying to do? And here, what's Peter trying to do throughout his letter? His overall goal is to encourage believers who are suffering that there is victory at the end, like Jesus. And so if that's his goal, that narrowed down, narrows down our interpretations quite severely, doesn't it? Because the whole point here isn't that Jesus all of a sudden changes gears and now he's talking about, you know, people being saved. The point, as you look at verse 22, is that at the end of it all, at the end of the day, Jesus is now uh, such an overcomer that all of the spiritual beings are under his rule. That Christians don't need to fear anything or anyone, including in the spiritual world. You, you look at a passage like chapter 5, verse 8, where uh, Satan is talked about as a lion who's prowling around. And Peter says, you don't have to fear him because Christ has overcome him. And after he suffered, you are going to uh, uh, follow in his footsteps into his victory. Uh, that said, there's still a few interpretations that are possible for this passage. I'm not going to talk about them, but I will tell you this. Uh, never do I see um, in the New Testament spirits referring to uh, people. There's only one instance of that, and that's qualified and explained in the book of Hebrews. But elsewhere, normally that's not the case. It's talk, uh, You talk about uh, spiritual beings, perhaps like that, like angels or demons. Um, the word for proclamation there, also it's important for you to know, is not the usual word for preaching the gospel in the Greek. Um, it's instead a word for kind of a royal proclamation, a, a telling of something that has happened. And I think uh, when you look at verse 22, again, it just highlights uh, that Jesus has been victorious above, look at it, angels, authorities, which is a bit ambiguous, you know, earthly authorities like governments or spiritual beings, and certainly powers. That doesn't leave anything that's not subject to his kingly rule. It's kind of like when you're reading uh, Colossians 2.15, isn't it? When Jesus uh, says through the apostle Paul, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing them over, uh, triumphing over them by the cross. 
much like in the ancient world, when um, someone uh, conquered a people, they would parade them uh, into the city, the losers, in chains. And uh, simply what you would hear um, is the victory announced. Here's the team who's won. Here's now who's your emperor. And now that's what Jesus does um, to these uh, spiritual powers saying, I have won. Now, I conscious as well, um, as we move on, that when I say that this can't be people that have a second chance uh, for becoming uh, believers, I instantly think of other people I know in my family who I think, man, if, if this is the only time that they have, and if Hebrews 9.27 is right, um, after this, there's only being with God or being separated from God. That kind of gives me a not a nice feeling in my gut. And I think when we have that feeling, what we want to do is remind ourselves that our task is to prayerfully introduce others to Jesus, to seize every opportunity. Um, even in lockdown, we might have opportunities. I certainly want to be praying for that. But that's just a uh, by the by. I think the whole point of this section is Peter is saying, look, you, you Christians in the first century that I'm writing to, you're suffering. But I want you to be able to say this. It's hard right now. It's painful. But there's an end date. There's purpose. There will be victory because that's what happened with Jesus. And I'm following in his footsteps. And I think that's the same uh, for us today. And that's the same for you. If you don't feel you're in a tough place right now, if you live long enough, at some point you will be. And I pray that when the trials come tomorrow, we, like the Apostle Peter, are going to say, man, I count myself worthy to suffer, whether it's because I'm a Christian or just in general. Father, help me. Transform me. So that's suffer like Jesus with purpose, with an end in sight, with resurrection hope. But then he mentions this um, idea of Noah, who was outnumbered, and yet he was faithful. Now, here's what makes it hard, right? I say all this stuff, and then like Monday morning, um, you know, something happens that I don't like. Here's something that makes it really hard for me to actually do this stuff. If I feel that I'm the only one around, or that most people around me are not trying to live the same way, would you find that hard? I mean, I, I, I'd find that pretty hard, being outnumbered, okay? Uh, think with you for a second. I love thinking about when you're at the supermarket queue because that's a common scenario for me. Um, and um, because that's what's going to happen uh, next time you go to the supermarket because the queues are back. Hey, this week. So think you're in the supermarket queue for a second. Um, someone joins the queue. Um, you look at them. Uh, they're just wearing their mask completely the wrong way. Okay. Um, their mask is just over here. Big, huge nose just sticking over it, okay? Or um, they're wearing gloves, wearing gloves because they want to be safe. They want to stay safe. And they and then they touch their face and they touch their phone, okay? And you're like, hmm, contradiction. Anyway, you don't say anything because you're a nice guy. You're a nice girl. Person in front of you, in between you and them, looks at you, quick little British tutting, rolling of the eyes, yeah? How do you feel right now? How hard is it for you to look at that person in the eye and not agree? For you to do anything other than, you know, a tacit agreement. How hard is it? How hard is it when you go into the staff room, into the office, and there's a good bit of juicy, slobbery gossip around for you to just kind of not participate? How hard is that? Worse, how hard is it not for you to not only not participate, but for you to actually say, hey guys, actually, I feel that's really unkind. Like, how hard would you find that? It's hard, isn't it? It's nigh on impossible, um, even for those pastors who are paid to do Christian ministry. I think the reason why these things are hard is because we are made to live in community under God's loving rule. And when we don't, you know, because we live in a world that's broken, when everyone else around us isn't trying to live in community under God's rule, we want to follow them because we don't like being outnumbered. 
You know, have you ever heard of Stanley Milgram? Anybody? Stanley Milgram. Oh, oh, some of you. Okay, a couple of you. Um, Solomon Ash. These guys have done some uh, psychology. Yes, yeah, some of you uh, teenagers who do psychology. Um, social experiments, right? So one of uh, Solomon Ash's experiments uh, was that you would be invited to a room. Okay, and there's other participants there. But actually, what you don't know is everyone else in that room is an actor paid to give one answer and one answer only um, for each particular uh, group of people. Here's what they would do. You're the guest. They'll say, look, uh, look at the picture on the right. Uh, there are a few lines. I'm going to show you a picture on the left. I want you to tell me whether A, B or C um, are the match for the picture on the left. Now, for some of the time, the actors would have been paid to say the wrong answer. So they might say, actually, um, it's A, you know, but the whole experiment was, was arranged so that you would be the last person to speak. So you would have had like five, ten people all consistently say the wrong answer. And the point of the experiment was to say, would you cave under the social pressure and actually say the wrong answer? Or would you stand your ground? Now, you might be surprised to know that over 30 percent of the people in the experiment followed the actors. It's really interesting, isn't it? And that's with something that's not even a moral question. OK, I'm not even going to tell you about Stanley Milgram's experiment um, about obedience to authority, where people continually heard someone else suffer every time they pressed the button. And yet, while that person was screaming, they still did it simply because they obeyed the authority over them. Now, here's the upshot. I think we just don't like to be outnumbered. And I think that the social pressure is huge. So that's why Peter mentions the example of Noah in the book of Genesis. Now, Noah was outnumbered, faithful, even in the middle of that, even if he may not have been necessarily eloquent. He had a way with words. We don't know. But he had this eternal perspective of judgment is coming. I know I'm ready. I will continue to be faithful, even when, verse 20, those who were disobedient long ago were around him. He was an expression of God's patience. Every time he continued to be faithful, he was an expression of God's patience. And as a result, he was safe. Now, you think you had it bad being in lockdown with your family. OK, what if I told you you'd be surrounded by people who want to spend all of their free time doing and thinking what is nasty, serving only themselves and no one else? You know, maybe people that you would be hanging out with them, but you couldn't say, hey, what are you thinking? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? You could never ask that question because the answer would be, yeah, I'm thinking evil all the time. Because according to Genesis 6, 5, Here's the description of people around the time of Noah who outnumbered him. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Outnumbered is bad. Outnumbered by people who completely disagree with you is a little bit worse. Outnumbered uh, by people who disagree on what is good and how you should live that's the worst option of all, isn't it? And yet, the example of Noah is mentioned because Peter understands that it's hard. And he writes to them saying, yes, it's hard. Carry on. Persevere. Like Christ, following his footsteps, like Noah. Uh, Noah uh, saw everyone else around him being judged rightly. And yet, he escaped because he trusted in God. Now, we live in a day where people might not say it out loud, but they behave like they might say this. You can be a Christian. Just don't let it cost you anything. Just don't let it show in the way that you talk or in the way that you try and persuade me. Just don't do that. Keep, keep it to yourself. Keep it private. It's good for you. True for you. Keep it to yourself. You know, don't let it show in your habits, in the way that you serve other people. Don't let it show in the way that you spend money. And the way that you give, don't let it show in your relationships, in the way that perhaps you give up even certain friendships, if they are detrimental to your relationship with God, in the way that you give up love relationships because they don't fit with God's plan. 
no, no, no matter how much outnumbered uh, you might be, focus like Noah. And as we bring this to a close, uh, I find a huge challenge in this because um, I was thinking about this and just thinking about how for Noah, his faith, his uh, following Jesus, loving him uh, in the way that he knew uh, by God's revelation at the time, cost him a lot. He must. He would have felt quite lonely, actually, when I think about it. just you and your family. Could you explain to someone else what your faith in Christ has cost you on a daily basis as you seek to hate sin and love uh, the Jesus who brought you to God? If after much thought and prayer, you can't work out what your faith costs you, Christian, I will suggest to you that perhaps you are not a Christian. Because here, the Jesus who in verse 18 uh, describes uh, being a believer as being brought to God, in chapter 1 verse 14 describes Christians as being obedient. But in the Gospels, Jesus says, the whole point is you deny yourself, you take up your cross and you come and you follow me. And so we're going to see in next week uh, that there's this challenging thought uh, in chapter 4, verse 1. If that's us, there's a cost. We're finished with sin. That's what chapter 4 is going to say. But we hear this message coming through again and again in the book of 1 Peter. Christian, when it's tough, when you're outnumbered, I'm going to strengthen you. I will sustain you when you feel lonely when you feel that you are growing more like Christ, but it's hard, isn't it? Fantastic to have that confidence. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good. And yet suffering like Jesus brings us purpose, has an end to our tough times. It's followed by resurrection hope that we see a little by little in our Christian life, that suffering like Noah uh, even if you're outnumbered, God can still strengthen us to be faithful. Now I'm going to pray for us. Um, and that's kind of the end. Um, if you're a young person, you're going to stay in the call after I pray. Um, if not, you can do the, the, the usual bye. Um, but I'm going to pray now uh, and just thank the Lord uh, for what we've been talking about. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have sustained Noah as an example. How hard must it have been uh, to actually have all of your close friends of many years, your neighbors, actually judge you because you believe in something that to them is completely crazy, that there's going to be a flood, that there's going to be judgment. And yet he was right. And yet, like Noah, we um, believe that you will one day judge the world. And yet we also believe we're inviting people into a, a, a wonderful and abundant and lovely relationship with you. We pray, Father, give us the confidence that we need, that we are following in the steps of Jesus, in the steps of Noah, and that that is good for us. Please grow us um, through the tough times that you have already planned um, for our lives. Today, tomorrow, lockdown, years to come. Please help us to persevere by the power that you give, by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.